So we are back in action tonight, and we are going to pick up where we left off. Uh, we're going to be working on our handout that uh, is titled Themes, because we are looking at different themes that kind of propel the action here in the book of Joshua. We spent quite a bit of time talking about the harem, or the, the ban, the dedication, uh, and uh, spent a good amount of time with that. So we're going to pick up with our third theme for the book of Joshua. And let's just, uh, before I, before we do that, let me first ask, are there any, any follow-up items or anything that, uh, we need to clarify before we forge on ahead? And if not, that's okay. All right, let's go ahead and we will start, uh, in chapter six. So we are going to go to Joshua 6, 1 through 5. So Tom, let me have you start in Joshua 6. And then Mark, if you would be ready with Joshua 10. And I will pick up those citations from 23 and 24. <clears throat> okay, uh, 1 through 5. Now Jericho was shut up inside and out because of the Israelites. No one came out and no one went in. The Lord said to Joshua, see, I have handed Jericho over to you along with its kings and soldiers. You shall march around the city, all the warriors circling the city once. Thus you shall do for six days with seven priests bearing seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark. On the seventh day, you shall march around the city seven times, the priests blowing the trumpets. When they make a long blast with the ram's horn, as soon as, as soon as you hear the sound of the trumpet, then all the people shall shout with a great shout, and the wall of the city will fall down flat, and all the people shall charge straight ahead. Okay. Just to kind of set the tone as we discern this next theme. Who is coming up with this battle plan? Or where is this battle plan coming from? God. Yeah, this is not Joshua talking about this. This is not him calling a, a war council or anything. God has said, this is the way it's going to be. So it's based on what God does, not as much on what the people do. Is that fair? Yep. yep. Okay, so God, all right. What do we find in Joshua 10? The day when the Lord gave the Amorites over to the Israelites, Joshua spoke to the Lord and he said in the sight of Israel, Son, stand still at Gibeon and moon in the valley of Ajalon. And the sun stood still and the moon stopped until the nation took vengeance on their enemies. Is this not written in the book of Jashar? The sun stopped in midheaven and did not hurry to set for about a whole day. There has been no day like it before or since when the Lord heeded a human voice for the Lord fought for Israel. So, we have a natural phenomenon that is pretty remarkable here, that the, the sun stands still, the moon stands still. And yet, what is the end result of, of God making the sun stand still and God making the moon stand still? So they could continue to fight. Right. This, like it, it impacts the, the outcome of the battle. So it's not simply God doing this just to say, hey, look what I can do. There is a, an impact you can see among the people. When we get to chapters 23 and 24, this is what we, we hear. In 23, 1 through 3. A long time afterward, when the Lord had given rest to Israel from all their enemies and all around, and Joshua was old and well advanced in years, Joshua summoned all Israel, their elders and heads, their judges and officers, and said to them, I am now well old and well advanced in years. 
and you have seen all that the Lord your God has done to all these nations for your sake. For it is the Lord your God who has fought for you. And then out of chapter 24, verses 1 through 13. Then Joshua gathered all the tribes of Israel to Shechem and summoned the elders, the heads, the judges, the officers of Israel, and they presented themselves before God. And Joshua said to all the people, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Long ago your ancestors, Terah and his sons Abraham and Nahor, lived beyond the Euphrates and served other gods. Then I took your father Abraham from beyond the river and led him through all the land of Canaan and made his offspring many. I gave him Isaac, and to Isaac I gave Jacob and Esau. I gave Esau the hill country of Seir to possess, but Jacob and his children went down to Egypt. Then I sent Moses and Aaron, and I plagued Egypt with what I did in its midst, and afterwards I brought you out. When I brought your ancestors out of Egypt, you came to the sea, and the Egyptians pursued your ancestors with chariots and horsemen to the Red Sea. When they cried out to the Lord, he put darkness between you and the Egyptians and made the sea come upon them and cover them, and your eyes saw what I did to Egypt. Afterwards, you lived in the wilderness a long time. Then I brought you to the land of the Amorites who lived on the other side of the Jordan. They fought over you. And I handed them over to you, and you took possession of their land, and I destroyed them before you. Then King Balak, son of Zippor of Moab, set out to fight against Israel. He sent and invited Balaam, son of Beor, to curse you. But I would not listen to Balaam. Therefore he blessed you, so I rescued you out of his hand. When he went over the Jordan and came to, the Jer came to Jericho, the citizens of Jericho fought against you, and also the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Girgashites, and the Hevites, and the Jebusites, and I handed them over to you. I sent the hornet ahead of you, which drove out before you the two kings of the Amorites. It was not by your sword or by your bow. I gave you a land on which you had not labored, and the towns that you had not built, and you live in them, and you eat the fruit of vineyards and olive yards that you did not plant. So what is the, what is the common thread we see here in these four, um, these four citations? God wanted to make it clear that this wasn't by their own doing, mm -hmm. that they came to take possession of all this. Right. So, yeah, I, I was about to say, you know, this wasn't by their own doing. What is this? But you said it is taking possession of this land. So God is making it clear that these, these things that could be looked at as human events, you know, it's just how, how the war has gone or what have you. Joshua is making it clear that it's not that simple. God is at work, and you can, the visible or tangible results of God being at work is what's going on with human events. Or to say it another way, the way that I say it on the handout there, while certainly not denying that God is active in nature, the Hebrew Bible and Joshua in particular insist that God reveals himself primarily through history. Events that people have experienced are where God shows up. And that is... That is one of the distinctions between the religion of Israel and the religion of many neighboring peoples where you had storm gods and fertility gods and lots of natural phenomenon were all controlled by gods. And that was kind of the primary place where you looked to see the supernatural at work in things. But the Hebrew view of things is that God is most visible in history. God intervenes in the human events on a regular basis. 
Uh, and sometimes, like in the book of Joshua, we see that very clearly. Um, you know, God is clear. I am doing this. This is not you. I am making this happen. Now, the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Hevites, the Jebusites, and so on, they might tell the story very differently. They might tell the story of we, you know, our our commander was asleep at the switch, and that's why we lost the war. They might say we were we were outnumbered. They had better technology. Whatever the case may be, they might tell the story very differently. But for the people of Israel, the point in Joshua is that God is at work in these human events. God reveals God's self through history. Uh, as one scholar, Jerome Creech, put it, Joshua assumes God regularly entered human history and there showed his lordship. But modernity has radically altered this understanding of reality so that to the modern mind, humans make history. Such an imperious self-understanding can render God irrelevant to the historical process. And I thought that was a very interesting commentary uh, on this in that it, I think we are maybe sometimes reticent to say, yes, this was God at work in this, that, or the other historical event. And yet for the people who wrote the Bible, there was no other way to interpret history, but it was the story of what happened because God intervened in history. Thoughts? It, it would seem to me that that, especially with respect to the, uh, you know, the Jewish nation, that the um, given what's all going on in the world today and even for the last century or so that maybe that's still happening. I mean, when you look what happened in the thirties and forties with the Holocaust and the tremendous suffering of the Jews that would rival anything that happened even in biblical times, but yet, yet um, the forces of that evil were defeated and, you know, kind of as a result of that, they then had the reestablishment of the nation of Israel and obviously their neighbors and from day one have been um, plotting and warring against them. And, um, and then even just in the last year with the events of October 7th and, uh, and now the, um, the almost, um, I don't know, almost miraculous destruction of some of the enemies around them. It makes you think that um, maybe there's still some of that going on. I mean, you know, who, who are we to say, but you can't help but think that, especially reading, reading Joshua right now. And of course, within, within Israel and within the Jewish community, there's of course, a number of different views on that, um, you know, about is is this God at work creating this modern nation state? Um, and, you know, people come down on all different sides of how they might answer that question. But, um, yeah, I, I mean, it's certainly, I feel like often we, we have those questions about is God involved in history is God involved in human events when we when we see things that we can't make sense of otherwise um, we kind of use God as the the last resort you know how could God let this happen I don't know maybe God didn't let it happen maybe people are just that rotten uh, I don't know. Well, with respect to the Holocaust, you could ask how could God let that happen, but in the end, those forces were defeated. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I do have one question. Yes. And I don't know why this 
sticks with me. But when it says, I sent the hornet ahead of you, which sounds really, really cool. But in in my uh, in my study Bible, it says that, you know, the actual term is unknown for hornet. Mm-hmm. I, I'm assuming maybe it, but it seems to me something they would have, he would have sent, he could have sent something, you know, some sort of insect or whatever. Right. Um, yeah, the only footnote I have in this Bible is meaning of Hebrew uncertain. Um, you know, how they settled on, on Hornet is, is interesting. I'm sure, you know, there's some good scholarship behind that. Um, but yeah, it's also interesting that it, because I don't, see anywhere else in Joshua where it talks about you know God sent some <clears throat> something other than the fighting people of Israel to go yeah, there's not really any other accounts that oh God sent locusts ahead or anything like that so it's um, that's kind of interesting that that's thrown in there here in this summary of the story and yet we don't see anything at least i have not seen anything that would correspond to that elsewhere in the in the account oh and and i i would assume that it was something specific right not like not like a general term of like an insect or a pest i said Mm -hmm. the pest of it it seems to me that he would have been it, it would have been specific we just don't know what it was Right, and that is that is one of the challenges. Um, one of the challenges that the folks who spend more time with the Hebrew Bible have that uh, New Testament scholars do not run into as often, um, because the Bible is, you know, kind of the only text we have in ancient Hebrew, whereas in ancient Greek we have thousands and thousands of texts so we can compare it across lots of places and kind of use other resources to, to come up with some meanings. There's there's a handful of words that I think are only used in the New Testament. Um, for instance, the, the word that we translate as daily, you know, give us this day our daily bread. Um, that's not a word we find elsewhere. So it's it's a little bizarre how we try and figure out what it is. But anyway, um, the whole point is that whatever this hornet is, God has done it as a means to intervene into human history. This happens so that these people will lose the battle, which will allow these other people to take possession of the land. Um, so theme theme three would be that idea that God reveals himself primarily through history, through the events that we can inquire about, through the stories that we can tell about what happened. Will people, does that hold water for folks? Yep. Fantastic. Uh, Our fourth theme. Uh, Let's start back at the top uh, with Tom. If you could share with us, please, Joshua 1, 2 through 6. Uh, I'll take those middle two citations. And then, Mark, if you could be ready with Joshua 21, 43 through 45. My servant Moses is dead. Now proceed to cross the Jordan, you and all his all this people, into the land that I am giving to them, to the Israelites. Every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given to you as I promised to Moses. From the wilderness and the Lebanon, as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, All the land of the Hittites to the great sea in the west shall be your territory. No one shall be able to stand against you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not fail you or forsake you. 
Be strong and courageous, for you shall put this people in possession of the land that I swore to their ancestors to give them. So then when we get to chapter 5, verse 6, uh, we hear this. For the Israelites traveled 40 years in the wilderness until all the nation, the warriors who came out of Egypt, perished, not having listened to the voice of the Lord. To them, the Lord swore that he would not let them see the land that he had sworn to their ancestors to give us, a land flowing with milk and honey. And in chapter 11, verse 23, we get this. So Joshua took the whole land according to all that the Lord had spoken to Moses, and Joshua gave it for an inheritance to Israel according to their tribal allotments, and the land had rest from war. And then, Mark, what do we get at the end of the book here uh, in chapter 21? The Lord gave to Israel all the land that he swore to their ancestors that he would give them. And having taken possession of it, they settled there. And the Lord gave them rest on every side, just as he had sworn to their ancestors. Not one of all their enemies had withstood them. For the Lord had given all their enemies into their hands. Not one of all the good promises that the Lord had made to the house of Israel had failed. All came to pass. So what would we say is the the theme that these are bringing up to the top for us? Uh, God made good on his promises. Yeah. Everything that's going on in this book is God fulfilling these promises. Uh, you know, just as I promised to Moses, as I swore to your ancestors, um, not one of these promises failed. So God giving the people the land, God is fulfilling the promise. Um, and if there's one thing we can say about God, God keeps promises. Um, you've probably heard me say that uh, more than once before, but that's that's a big part of where, where my theology is at. Um, and I, I think that gels with what Joshua has to say here. However... This good news that God has made this spectacular promise that I will give these people the land, and now God is fulfilling the promise because that's what God does, it also comes with a word of caution. Tom, what do we see in chapter 23, 11 through 13? Be very careful, therefore, to love the Lord your God. For if you turn back and join the survivors of these nations left here among you and intermarry with them so that you marry their women and they yours, know assuredly that the Lord your God will not continue to drive out these nations before you, but they shall be a snare and a trap for you, a scourge on your sides and thorns in your eyes, until you perish from this good land that the Lord your God has given you. And Mark, if we jump down a couple of verses there to verse 16, what do we what do we hear? Sorry. If you transgress the covenant of the Lord your God, which he enjoined on you, and go and serve other gods and bow down to them, then the anger of the Lord will be kindled against you, and you shall perish quickly from the good land that he has given you. So, I think, <clears throat> I think we can read these, these words as having two different functions based on kind of when, when these words are heard. So when Joshua speaks these words, when he first is giving this, this farewell address, um, and the people have conquered the land, they are getting settled in the land. What's the function of these words at that point? Or how, how do we hear those words if we are the people who are settling the land? Those well, kind of the same old theme, um, do as God commands or forfeit what God has given you. 
So it's kind of a word of warning or admonishment. It's kind of this you, idea. I'm sorry, go ahead. You, know, you, you, you talked earlier about um, God injects himself primarily through history. Mm -hmm. It just seems to me that through the course of history, the Israelites have been held to much a much higher standard. You know, they've they've suffered more than any other people, it seems. But that they're, they're always coming back. They bounce back, which is not to be said of a lot of other um, peoples uh, or in the world, mm -hmm. you know, maybe the American Indians and, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But yeah, it, it just seems to me through reading all of this, especially with Joshua, that, you know, and knowing what happens later in history, especially it just, yeah. but they always come back, you know, they come back strong. Yeah. So. And, and that idea of, you know, it's not that, it's not that these other people's fell off the face of the earth they moved and intermarried with other groups and you know identities moved and changed and shifted but israel has always kept that sense of of identity and what matters about that identity or or what are the markers of that identity that conversation changes uh through time so for example in the early to mid first century Sabbath observance was was a big deal. That was a hot topic. Interpretation of scripture. How do we apply these commandments? What do they actually mean? Um, off the top of my head, I don't remember. There are one or two other things that scholars have really identified as, you know, these are kind of the hot topics. And guess what? Those are exactly the things that Jesus finds himself arguing with other Jewish people about. They want to know, you know, what, what do you think about Sabbath observance? You really think it's okay to do, you know, X, Y, or Z on the Sabbath? Well, that was an important part of maintaining an identity. So when Joshua speaks these words to his contemporaries, they're they're a warning. They are they are words that look forward and say, going forward, we know exactly what we should be doing. If we don't do that, we will perish from the land. We will not be in possession of this good land God has given us. Now, of course, in the form we have these words it, as a as a written word. When, when do we surmise that this was probably written down? It was passed down faithfully through oral tradition for many years, and then they got to a point and said, it's probably good if we write this down. About when, when does that occur? Uh, around the time when they come back from uh, Babylon or, or, or are captured in Babylon somewhere in there. Right. So... Yeah, it is likely tied in with the exile when the people are no longer on the land and they don't see all the places that remind them of the story. They say, we, we better write this down. So if you are part of the people who are in exile, you're sitting next to the, the Euphrates River in Babylon and you read this hot off the presses, the book of Joshua, and you read these words that say, do not intermarry with these people or you will perish from the land. Do not serve other gods and bow down to them, or the anger of God will be kindled against you. How do those words, uh, how do we receive those words differently if we are the people experiencing the exile who actually have perished from the land, who find ourselves not in possession of that land? Uh, you know, even though it's, you know, a long time before, it's kind of a come to Jesus moment, I would think. So right. this is how we got here, because it, it was quite some time, wasn't it, between 
you know, when Joshua was, was around and they fought for the land and then yep. the exile, it yep. was a long time, wasn't it? Several hundred years, yes. Yeah. So the people who were sitting there in Babylon maybe had no idea of their history, their true history. I'm guessing. I, I don't know. But but if they're reading this stuff and going, you know, thinking, how did how did we get here? Right. And this is an answer. Yeah. No, I, I think you hit the nail right on the head that for the people in the time of the exile, I think reading those words now when they now when they they have like we said perished from the land and they read these words that say if you intermarry with the other people and they bring their gods with them that's a problem if you bow down and worship other gods that's a problem and so i i think what we have here is you could say an explanation or maybe a, a more precise way to say is you have a a theological interpretation of those present circumstances. They, they are looking back on history in an attempt to make meaning. They are looking back on history, like you said, Mark, precisely to figure out how did we get here? God gave us this land as a gift. How, how did we possibly end up not on the land? Well, when God gave the land, God said, there are some things you need to make sure that you do in order to continue to possess this gift. And as as we find out, as we get further and further into the, the story, there are plenty of people who do not honor that, who do not honor that covenant. So again, I think as we as we've seen in a few places, the difference between what did the words mean when they were first spoken or what did the events mean when they first took place and what did they mean to the people who put them down in the form that we have it so i think it's interesting just to see those those different layers of understanding there other thoughts the uh, the intermarry and um you know i think it is kind of interesting i i would think that even over the course of the centuries you know that that most jews have married within you know their own faith and i think you know even like a century earlier it would be probably more verboten to have uh, intermarried than it probably is today of which there is obviously some um, but, you know, it's kind of interesting that that, that commandment from Joshua really has transcended the centuries and it, it would be interesting if we had the, the one, um, uh, Jewish rabbi who we've had before address that question and see how he would handle it at, mm. in terms of how he would view that in today's world. Yeah, what what is the in what ways is the commandment understood uh or or applied today? Which of course, you know, you would get different interpretations from different uh different rabbis, but yeah, that that would be interesting to find out. Mhm. Mm So let us go ahead and, and turn to our, our fifth theme. Um, and we'll just go ahead, we'll just go down the list and uh, we'll go Tom, then Mark, then me, and we'll just go through. These are all very short uh, citations here. So we'll just go ahead, read through all of them and then figure out what is the what is the common thread that holds them together. So Tom, will you start with uh, Joshua 4 verse 9? Joshua set up 12 stones in the middle of the Jordan 
in the place where the feet of the priest bearing the Ark of the Covenant had stood, and they are there to this day. The Lord said to Joshua, Today I have rolled away from you the disgrace of Egypt, and so that place is called Gilgal to this day. Joshua 6.25 But Rahab the prostitute with her family and all who belonged to her, Joshua spared. Her family has lived in Israel ever since, for she hid the messengers whom Joshua sent to spy out Jericho. In chapter 7, Joshua said, Why did you bring trouble on us? The Lord is bringing trouble on you today. And all Israel stoned him to death, and they burned them with fire, cast stones on them, and raised over him a great heap of stones that remains to this day. Then the Lord turned from his burning anger. Therefore, that place to this day is called the Valley of Achor. So Joshua burned Ai and made it forever a heap of ruins as it is to this day. And he hanged the king of Ai on a tree until evening. That sunset Joshua commanded, and they took his body down from the tree, threw it down at the entrance of the gate of the city, and raised over it a great heap of stones, which stand there to this day. So Joshua 13, verse 13. Yet the Israelites did not drive out the Geshurites and the Maccathites, but Geshur and Maketh live within Israel to this day. Chapter 14, so Hebron became the inheritance of Caleb, son of Jephnoah and Kazite, to this day, because he wholeheartedly followed the Lord, the God of Israel. In 1563, but the people of Judah could not drive out the Jebusites, the inhabitants of Jerusalem. So the Jebusites live with the people of Judah in Jerusalem to this day. And Joshua 16.10. They did not, however, drive out the Canaanites who lived in Gezer. So the Canaanites have lived within Ephraim to this day, but have been made to do forced labor. So what, what is the common thread? What is the theme that emerges from all of these citations? To this day. Right? And what is, what is the function of saying such and such to this day? It was a monumental, something monumental happened at that time, and it shall forever be captured by history as right. with, with an everlasting right. remembrance, I guess, of that fact. So so for several of these things, it's, hey, you know, there are some stones set up by the Jordan River. And the reason those are there is because Joshua put them at the spot where the feet of the people who carried the ark were. That's why those stones are there. This is the place where God rolled away the shame of Egypt. That's why we call it Gilgal. That's why we call it the rolling place. Um, we have various people living within Israel who are not Israelites. Well, some of them are Rahab's people. Why? Because Rahab helped Joshua. Um, some of these other people, why are they there? Well, because they couldn't be driven out. So there's a lot of things in Joshua that explain how stuff came to be the way it is. Um, so that theme is Joshua wants us to understand why things in this land are the way they are. Why is there a big heap of stones there? Well, let me tell you the story. Um, why are there these weird people who seem like they don't fit in? Well, there's a reason for it. So there's a lot in Joshua that explains why things are the way they are. Uh, does anyone know the scholarly term for this type of content? No. This is this is what we would refer to as etiology. E-T-I-O-L-O-G-Y. 
Uh, and sometimes in some texts you see it spelled A-E-T-I-O-L-O-G-Y. Uh, it's the study of kind of how things come into being. Um, so there's a lot of that content in Joshua. Uh, do you have any, can you think of anything off the top of your head, stories we tell in the United States about this is why we do blank or this is how whatever it is came to be? Thanksgiving Day. S say more. Well, about the pilgrims and the settlers, and the, they all got together and gave thanks for the har harvest and had a big meal. Right. So we the reason we celebrate this is because a long time ago, the pilgrims and the people who were already living there got together and gave thanks together, right? So yeah. it's, it's an etiology. It's why we have this holiday. Um, it has a lot more to do with Abraham Lincoln declaring it a holiday, um, but the story helps us remember that that piece of the history. Um, so yeah, it, exactly. It's we. There are similar things that that go on in in many cultures that have the same function, uh, and in fact, uh, that note that Rahab and her people lived among the Israelites, um, when we turn to Matthew's gospel, Rahab is actually one of the ancestors of King David, which makes her one of the ancestors of Jesus. Um, so yeah, that, that particular etiology has, has very long legs. It stays with us for a long time. So uh, I think those are the, those are the themes that kind of hold the book of Joshua together. Uh, we're going to look at kind of how Joshua tells the story. We've done a lot of work with kind of finding the layers and maybe why the story is told the way it is, um, kind of the themes, what are the ideas that the story wants to get across. And then next week, we'll actually get into what are, what are the things that happen in the story. Um, so we will move into that. Uh, we'll spend a little bit of time with kind of how Joshua has been received into uh, Christian understanding. And then after that, uh, we'll we'll see whatever we have next. But we, we will be back with Joshua next week. Um, let me pause there. Questions, thoughts? I have a question. Yes. Uh, it, they were sent in to drive everybody out, right? Yep. Not necessarily destroy everybody, just drive them all out. Mm -hmm. So, does that mean that they were they were allowed to live just to be a I don't know a, a, a temptation over time or uh, as a you know, just something that the people had to, um, I, I don't know, just make right. sure they avoided them or, yeah, what, or do, what? I, yeah, what do we make of it? I, yeah, I, in my mind, the the simplest explanation is God gave the commandment: get rid of all of the people who are there, whether you make them move somewhere else, or you mow them all down, get rid of all the people who are there. And it is the, the inability to fully follow through on that commandment that I think continues to echo down through a good chunk of the rest of the story in the Bible. Um, because yes, there are these peoples who are there fighting with them over the land. Um, some of them are other countries that come in, but, you know, the, the Philistines, they they are there. Um, you know, they, they are there on the land, and this conflict continues to rage back and forth throughout Scripture. So I, I think we would be on good theological ground, at least, to think about it in terms of God said, get rid of all the people. And 
whether it was a inability to do that or people deciding, well, you know, God gave this commandment, but we got rid of most of the people. That's good enough, isn't it? Whatever the case may be, the people didn't fulfill the commandment. Therefore, it continued to be a source of, of problem. I think that would be the theological, the simplest theological reading to it. Um, that makes more sense. At least it, it gives me some clarity. Right. And again, we need to remember we are reading reading the story through through a particular viewpoint. Um, so we need to kind of think about it in terms of that viewpoint. What are the things that would make sense? What are the things that people would want to communicate? And I think one of the big things without question is God gives a commandment. You, you do everything you can to honor that commandment. So maybe the failure to do that is going to cause problems. So I think that would be one, one way to understand that. Sorry, thirsty. Other thoughts, other insights? And if not, that's okay. I am perfectly fine with uh, calling it a night a little bit early tonight as we, as at least I, ease back into being here. Uh, but we will be back with more from Joshua next week. Um, let us go ahead and, and close our time tonight praying the Lord's Prayer. Uh, would someone be willing to offer that prayer on behalf of the group? Because we have found that everyone praying together at the same time does not work as well on Zoom as it does in person. I'll, I'll do it. Thank you. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you, everyone, for your time and your insight. And uh, we'll see everybody back here next week. Okay, Sounds good. good. Welcome back. Yep. Thank you. Good night. Good night.